So, um, place to start. This is, as you know, the, the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination today in Memphis. So uh, it's important, I think, to kind of understand ourselves in that historic, understand history and understand that historical reality. Um, we don't often see ourselves uh, in history. I wear two hats, historian and political economist. We don't often think of ourselves as um, people who make history. I'm talking to the person in your chair. We don't often think of ourselves as somebody who could actually contribute to the building of a powerful movement over time to transform the economic and political system. Uh, we have a vested interest in pessimism. Why vested? If you believe nothing serious can be done, you don't have to do anything. Now, I suspect you wouldn't be here if you believed that, but I also suspect most people don't actually stand back and say, what we're doing might be capable. Now, think of Dr. King. He was just a guy before he became Martin Luther King Jr. that everybody knows. And so were the SNCC kids who first sat down in those seats. And they were just like us, the people in this room. Nothing fancy, just us. <laughs> Nobody here but us, they used, they used to say. And they created a transformative movement. They did it in part because they were courageous, in part because they decided, I'm not going to listen, I'm not going to sit here much longer and wait. I'm going to do something, even though it seems impossible, uh, against huge odds. I'm going to do something. Uh, and partly because the times were right. A lot of people tried those things in the Civil Rights Movement, for instance, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and got nowhere. They thought they got nowhere, but actually they were putting pebbles on the ground that people could build on. Some of them are my heroes, the ones in the 30s and 40s, because they laid down the groundwork for what came later. What came later couldn't have come without that work. So if you think I'm raising that because maybe we ought to be doing some groundwork laying, I am indeed saying that in other areas, and there's a model out there. So if you think of yourself historically, it's partly about people actually willing to do something here and now to build something, and partly about whether the times permit something, and partly about the level of pain that people are feeling, either emotionally or economically or socially or in their conscience about what's happening to climate change. Environmental issues are really interesting because for lots of people, it doesn't affect them. Most people won't actually experience all the dangers of climate change. Personally, they won't experience it, but they know that there's a moral issue here that goes beyond just what do I got, what's in it for me. So my, my opening kind of reflection and how I think about all of this as partly a historian and partly a political economist who's been doing this kind of thing for a long time, is, is not only say that I think that historically you guys are living in an extremely interesting time, potentially, but also that the conditions that are permitting something to happen are changing. Some of it is pain levels, some of it is idealism, and I'm going to get into that. But another way to look at it is, is this. I've been traveling around the country and doing research and talking to lots of folks. And this thing called, quote, the new economy movement uh, is, in fact, building up to become a, quote, movement. Now, what does that mean? Almost every place I've gone, there are lots of people beginning to, for instance, set up local co-ops. It isn't just people here thinking about co-ops. And Thomas Beckett, who I think talked to you earlier, probably went through a range of them. Some of them small scale, some of them medium scale, some of them large scale. We can talk more about the big ones we've been involved with in Cleveland where, you know, these are worker owned co-ops in Cleveland now operating at the level of, for instance, a new urban greenhouse owned by workers and the community. It's the largest one in the United States in an urban area. It produces three million heads of lettuce a year plus other things. That's one level of co-op. There are smaller scale co-ops that are people are building, doing great things, and learning how to do this stuff. Laying groundwork, maybe, 
see yourself in history, maybe for laying groundwork for what might happen. There are people who are very interested in how you build resilient communities. There are people interested in what we do actually about climate change. There are people building not only land, the land trusts, there are public owned entities developing. So did you know, for instance, that 25% of American electricity is generated by socialist entities? Right here in America, mostly in the South. Now what does that mean? It means public utilities and co-ops actually today in modern America produce 25% of our electricity. That's very conventional and many communities are trying to build on that to say why don't we do more of that? Build out the co-ops and make, take over some of the private power companies. There were 16 of them taken over in the last decade. New York Times had a big front page of the business stage. Power to the people. New York Times is not power to the people. But it's what it said, power to the people. What were they talking about? There's something happening, people beginning to build co-ops and credit and public utilities and turning them not only for power, but also thinking about the ecological aspects of it and the high tech aspects of it and the internet aspects of it and using this as a way to begin to build elements of the new economy. So that's one way to think about this. We've talked about the historical possibility of just sort of sketching that maybe if you think of yourself in history as laying down groundwork. The other is to ask, what does it mean institutionally? It's a funny word, institutionally. People like to do projects. Uh, I like projects, but I'm against projectism. Do you know what I mean? My project's better than yours. I do a great project. Projects are really important. They're important to do. They're important to learn. But if that's all they are, rather than part and parcel of building a larger movement, they will be marginal. So how we see ourselves and our projects in the new economy movement is the name of the game, whether they are stepping stones to something larger. Now, let me back off a little bit because I suspect, because I talked to folks here and I've been talking around the country, most people don't really think you can actually do something that can change big change. Not really. And it, they might be right, they might be right. But I have to tell you a little bit more about what I'm, where I'm coming from. I'm a kid from Racine, Wisconsin, kind of a dying industrial town in the southern part of the state, now being turned into a place where people bring their boats on Lake Michigan from the big cities of Chicago and Milwaukee and it's kind of becoming a semi-resort town rather than a place where, where working people could actually earn a living. Now, as many of my you know, kids are now getting jobs in the hotels and the resort business. There's some industry left. But I'm from Wisconsin, and I was brought up uh, at the time when Senator Joe McCarthy lived from Wisconsin. Now, those of you who know about political history, Joe McCarthy was a rabid right-wing guy far to the right of the Tea Party. And he was very, had a prominent national stage. So anybody who tried to do anything progressive at all, he would jump on them, put the spotlight on him, and say it's a communist. And people were frightened to death, really frightened. So people didn't want to do anything. And in Wisconsin, it was triple bad. People there knew this guy was right, hovering over. Teachers say something wrong in the classroom. Somebody reported him, and boom, he's fired. Those are the era I, I, lived, I lived in. So if you had read the tea leaves of the time about you know, how hard it is to do things and what about the Tea Party and what about all the conservatives who I gather maybe have taken over your legislature in this state right now and made some tough things and I've been hearing all that story. It, nothing like Wisconsin in the 1950s. But if you'd read the tea leaves of the time, what you absolutely knew, nothing really could change. They'd get you. <laughs> and then of course, Boom, the 60s exploded. The civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the feminist movement, and then after that trailing on it, the gay movement. Boom, 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 boom. Something was a brewing that didn't appear in the headlines. Now, I'm not saying it, it is inevitable, but I'm just challenging you from my experience to question whether or not conservative times at the moment tell you what's going on. One of, the reasons, one of the things that's going on, as I said, if you look around, and we're at the middle of this, and Rachel and, and Eli are at the middle of the information streams of what's happening around the country, there are groups like this one and many others being popping up just all over the country, people saying we've got to change the economy. 
We've got to make it ecologically sustainable. We've got to build some communities up. We have to actually think about bigger things. And we'll come to some of the bigger things we might talk about. And it is something very unusual. I've been studying this and been involved in it for a long time. In the last two and a half to three years, something has happened. And it's not been like this before, where people all over the country, not only young people, some of the older folks too, but lots of young people are saying, we've got to do something. I'm going to start here and then try to get some people to, together and build something. So that's the context. We can talk about some of the specific elements. The book is filled with elements of it. And I think Thomas must have talked a lot about co-ops this morning, and other people can go into that depth. But I'd really like to focus on the possibility that exists when people somehow begin to act in large numbers and say, we're going to try to do something. I think that's the environment we're facing. Now, let me shift it in a different way. We are talking, ultimately, uh, if it's for real, about changing the economic system, transforming the entire political economic system, the one that is dominated by very powerful organizations. Now, that's a little crazy. Everybody knows that. But on the other hand, you know, revolutions or transformations or evolutionary change is as common as grass in world history. Apartheid ended in South Africa. The Soviet Union collapsed. Small group of people here armed with flintlock guns defeated the most powerful empire in the history of the world, called the American Revolution. Uh, as a historian, I want to suggest to you, big change coming out of difficulty is not at all unusual, and we possibly may think about ourselves in that way. Now, I mentioned earlier the conditions that are producing this set of expanding activities, projects, concerns, meetings, flow of information on the internet, et cetera. What's that all about? Why is that happening? I think one of the things that's driving it is people have come to realize in some deeper way than they did previously that we're not going to get change out of the political system in Washington unless something very great happens and a movement develops, et cetera. But for the moment, things are going to get worse. Pain levels are increasing. Ecological problems are, tr are getting worse. There is more and more awareness that something wrong is wrong and it isn't going to be fixed the usual way. Now again, that appears in most people's lives as, you know, this is terrible. But if you see it historically, that's a big deal when people begin to realize something fundamental is wrong. Because that forces you to think about doing things in a different way. So instead of, oh, hey, nothing can be done, think about it this way. The awareness of large numbers of people that the old ways don't work is a big deal. It's the precondition of beginning to act in new ways because you're not going to get it the old way. That's what movements are about. That's what you guys are about, I think. So another piece of that is to think about it this way. We're facing a systemic challenge, not a political problem. A systemic challenge, not a political problem. Now, what does that mean? It means that the way in which the institutions of the political and economic system are organized and designed, the architecture of that system, big corporations, the way the politics works in Washington, et cetera, et cetera, and in your state legislature, that system is producing outcomes that are negative in many, many spheres over long periods of time. So here's one way to tell, you, tell, you, tell the difference between a system problem and a political problem. A system problem looked at over year by year by year produces this kind of a trend. The top 1% gets 10% of the income, and then slowly and steadily over three decades gets 24% of the income, and the rest go down. Long trends 10, 20, 30, 35 years tell you something deeper in the institutional power base is going on. That, by the way, is what's happened. The top 1%, this, think about this one. This is a hard one to grasp. It is so challenging. The top 1%
has gotten all of the gains in the economic system over the last 30 years. That's remarkable that all of the gains of the system have gone to 1%. That's a systemic problem. You might get a law to tax a little bit here and there and tickle that trend, but you're talking about very big deal when that kind of trend. CO2 emissions, 30 years up 30%. Long trends. Distribution of wealth. This is, this is another one that's hard to get your mind around. And, because it tells you you've got a systemic problem, not just a political problem. And if you've got a systemic problem, that means you're going to have to build a movement even more powerful than the Civil Rights Movement, and over decades like that. And that what you guys may be in on is the ground floor to lay the foundation so somebody later can build on what you've done. Strange idea. So think about that. It's another way to look at it. Here's the number I'm going to give you to kind of chew on for the rest of this discussion. The top 400 people... You could easily get them in this room. They have more wealth than the bottom 180 million people taken together. 400 people. That tells you there's a system problem. The concentration of ownership and power is extreme, and their interests may or may not be in ecological sustainability, in equity, in community reconstruction. <clears throat> their interests may be in building politics that will con continue to produce that result. So... If you look at it in terms of time dimension, over time, you, how do you change a system? And if you understand in terms of concentration of power, you know you're into an institutional question. That is to say, the large corporations that dominate and are largely owned by those folks will have to be changed if you want to deal with it ultimately without, with ecological problems, with CO2, with moving jobs around the country, with community development, with equity, with poverty. But it's got to change. And it isn't going to change through simple politics. It's going to change through a long evolution. So here's another way to think about it. If you don't like the outcomes produced by corporate capitalism, that kind we have, and you don't like the outcomes produced by socialism, state socialism, that kind we've had, those are the two systemic designs anybody's ever heard of. They both produced ecological decay and destruction. Socialism was worse, by the way, or state socialism. So now here's your problem. The old systems don't work, the two that anybody knows about. So if you want to deal with the problems that you're concerned with, either locally, food, environmentally, community, ecological, economic, etc., what you're talking about is changing the system to something that nobody's built yet. Here, I toss it in your lap. Look at it. That's, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I'm, you know, you guys are the younger ones. You're going to have to build it. We can just... Us, some of us old beard, white beards, are going to have to help a little bit, but that's your problem. If you don't like state socialism, you don't like corporate capitalism, what do you want and how do we get from here to there? Because that's the only way to change the outcomes. You like that? <laughs> Didn't think that was what this talk was going to be about, did you? That's the name of the game. And the new economy movement, in my view, is beginning to understand slowly, step by step, that that, in fact, is what we're talking about. And somehow grappling with that rather than saying, I'm just doing a project. So what does it mean? It means that people, for instance, are interested in worker co-ops and in democratic participation, not just because you might get a co-op to solve a local problem, but because you may be beginning to develop and model and learn enough of how it actually we could organize economic and ecological and community reality so that we're generating real democracy, changing who owns the wealth, cooperatives, changing participation, and changing ecological outcomes by real experience, knowing that we are going to have a lot of imperfection and failure. And that, that is not the end, that ain't the end of the game. The game is to learn from these experiments and developments, et cetera, that are going on in order to build wider and wider groups, in order to get much more sophisticated about the knowledge base, in order then ultimately to build politics and a political movement capable of enforcing the vision that we actually know enough about, because we work it out and actually learn by doing, here locally, wherever here locally is, 
and then begin to see that as ultimately the precondition of a politics that would, chance, that we would be transformative. South Africa collapsed, the American Revolution happened, etc., and all over the world. Look at Latin America. Those dictators are gone. They were there for 30 years. That's what I'm talking about. So I see what you guys are interested in, or you wouldn't be here, in that larger frame. And I think it's, it's extremely important to see some other elements of it that are also beginning to move, because they're allies, people interested in different parts of this. Another way to say this is, if we're talking about transformation, one of the key ways you talk about economic systems is not only about wealth ownership, but the institutions of power that go along with wealth ownership. Top down, one corp large corporations with their power structure versus local institutions called co-ops, that's a different structure of institutions, not just politics and not just projects. That's an institutional creation that we're talking about that points in a certain vision to a different vision, maybe. Well, a system involves that idea critically, that what we're actually building begins to model and teach us and learn what we might look for in the larger design that we will create, that we will create. I'm talking to the person in your chair. There's nobody else going to do this. You can't get off this hook. It's our problem, not their problem. And it's not just our project. It is a community problem nationally. So if you look around, what you see, for instance, other people kind of po poking at this in very interesting ways. So one, one way is this. Do you all know about the North Dakota Bank? How many do? See, this is interesting. Three or four, how many? All right. Bank of North Dakota, conservative state, is a socialist bank. It's owned by the state. Farmers love it, and so do the small businessmen, and so do the co-ops. And the money it makes goes back to the state. Been there for 95 years. Nobody knows about it. Can teach you something about how you really might want to enter design banking in the new system. And 20 states have introduced legislation already by, I say 20 states. People like the people in this room have found a way to get 20 states to introduce legislation to begin experimenting and say, hey, if they've done it in North Dakota, why don't we do it here? And that has, it did not have a bank failure and didn't have a crisis in the big banking crisis and has continued to be a stabilizer in the community. 20 states kind of there and there's a big conference coming up in early June on public banking. There was a little conference a couple of years ago and now it's getting to be a big conference because people are aware that something's got to change. Many cities are now putting their money because people actively ask them to, to put it in credit unions or in, in, in city banks, community banks of some kind that will invest locally. You know, a lot of taxpayer money in the city gets. Where does it put the money? Where does it deposit? Usually in the big bank. Don't have to do that. Maybe it could be focused only if it helps the community. That's going on all over the country, from not only liberal areas like San Francisco, but in Nebraska and Kansas. Many, by the way, website community-wealth.org. It just surveys this kind of stuff, and there's a lot of it in the book, too. But people don't know about it because the press doesn't cover it. So banking is another piece of it. Another piece of it is health care. That is, there's one state that is now going into, essentially, some sort of public democratized health care. That's Vermont. It's, ready to, it's, not only, it's on the books. It will happen in the next year. So Vermont will have a single-payer system, and... In California, it was, it was passed twice by the legislature and was vetoed by Schwarzenegger. Now, why do I mention that? Because a, a system of health care that is single-payer or democratized is part of a design. It's a big part of the design. Why? Health care in your economy and mine is now absorbing 20% of the whole economy. You change the health care system, you change a huge part of it. You democratize health care. You have got a big piece of the action. And there's a lot of people working on that. And moreover, what is driving that, like what is driving most of what we're talking about, is growing pain. The conditions that I mentioned at the outset, times are getting hard for a lot of people. Unemployment is very, is not only unemployment, but underemployment. Social and economic pains, big cutbacks on programs in Washington. Those are the conditions that are emerging which are making people ask questions. 15% unemployment is probably what we've got. 
If you actually counted it right, maybe 16%. Poverty is, if you counted it halfway decently, the way the rest of the world counts poverty, which is half the median income. Poverty is 25% here, maybe double in the black community, maybe not quite that bad in the brown, but almost. The statistics you see on 14 to 15% on poverty are a, a, a figment of someone's design for what is the criteria. Sidebar story, because how that happened. Do you know how, it, how poverty got designed? A young bureaucrat named Molly Orshansky in the Department, I think, of Health, Education, and Welfare was asked to say, what's the poverty level? She didn't, she didn't know. This is back in the, in the 50s. So she took the amount of food that an ordinary working family eats and pays for and multiplied by three inches. I think that's the thought poverty level. It has nothing to do with anything other than that, and it still exists, whereas most people in the world know it's a phony number, and ours is twice, what the reality is twice as bad and getting worse. These conditions that are producing are also, these difficulties are also, also producing the difficulties in healthcare. Healthcare costs are going out of the window, and you don't often think about them, except when you've got a job and you can't get health benefits. And they're being driven by the same power structure, in this case, large insurance companies and, so, and the drug companies plus the hospital complex. And they're producing health care costs that are twice the share of the economy than almost any other country. <clears throat> and the statistics on outcomes are worse. Our health is, on almost every indicator, we are way near the bottom in terms of the advanced countries. We pay twice as much per share. That system is generating internally great pain, social and economic pain, and huge costs that cannot be solved the old way. So either people are going to get thrown out, which is they are, or people are saying we're going to have to change it. So there are 20 states that are introduced legislation now to change that and make it single payer, where you can, cut, you can cut the share of the economy in half if you look at almost every other European country. And there's a way to solve the problem, but it involves institutional change. I mention that again, not so much because I want to try to convert you to healthcare, but I'm saying in different parts of the reality, people are beginning to realize that you gotta change the institutional substructure of the system. And that what's driving it is either high costs or growing economic pain and growing moral pain. What does that mean? Growing moral pain. People like people in this room like us, beginning to understand that somehow if we're complicit in, complicit by virtue of silence, that's the way to get complicit, just don't do anything. Who, me? Complicit in allowing these things to happen, then we are part of the problem. Where people losing their, their health care and the jobs and nobody doing it but you wouldn't be here if that's how you thought about these things. What you probably are here, at least that's what folks tell me, is because you're starting at the ecological end of the problem or the co-op end of the problem. That's a great place to start because that's the place to learn and develop and build, but I want to encourage you to see that in a larger perspective that also includes a lot of other folks helping you out in different areas, and what's driving the entire process is a new historical context that suggests we aren't going to go back to the old ways, what's likely is a continuation of what you see that is growing pain. So let me say just a little bit about that. I don't want to, lay out, I don't want to burden you with too much, but here's, here's the one way to think about it. Uh, the pain levels are obvious. We're talking about unemployment, poverty, climate change, this, this location, no jobs, cost of health care. I don't need to give you this whole story. You've probably heard it more than that. But the question most people usually think about is this. Well, the pendulum will swing. Maybe we'll get a bunch of progressives back in, or I suspect most progressives, and then we'll change all that because that's sort of how it happened in the past. Or there'll be a cycle. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., the great histor liberal historian, thought that every 30 years there'd be a cycle. I don't think so. I think you're living in a period where that's going to continue and that that whole idea needs to be understood as a end of an era idea. So one way to think about that is this. What really happened was the Great Depression occurred, big crisis, and a lot of people got thrown out of office, and the, we had an opportunity for progressive change that was very unusual because the huge crisis occurred. 
And that's how most of the programs you know about, Social Security and the precondition of Medicare and, Medi and labor laws and so forth that allowed the basis of that modern program was developed. The second one is the World War II occurred and helped strengthen labor unions, which were part and parcel of the institutional power structure that created Medicare and the environmental laws we now have. But it came out of very special conditions, the, the Depression and World War II and the post-war boom that followed. What we're likely to be entering, I think, is a period where the politics that was like that is itself decaying before your eyes, in significant part because the labor union base of that politics is declining, and also because the special conditions are not likely. What you're seeing is ongoing, very odd, pain and decay and difficulty and long trends, but not the idea that we're going to get a simple cycle. Not the idea that we'll get a big collapse, the government's three times the size it was relative to the economy that it was in 1929. The context into which I think we all are living and what is driving the pain and creating the questions in our minds is a context of stalemate, stagnation, and decay. That's what you see around if you look at people's lives in many parts of the country, plus elite ownership. That's a really interesting context. So I don't want to lay too much on you, but that is a very interesting context because it is allowing, no, forcing people to ask different questions. What's going on here in this rich country? That context is the kind of context that is driving people to look for unusual answers and new experiments and saying we've got to find a different way and we've got to build a new economy. That's what's creating the new economy movement. Plus, when people get active and concerned, them and we reaching out and then beginning to hold hands and build more in these different areas. So you're living in a context of pain, but the positive side of that is it's forcing people to wake up and get on with it and begin to develop. You know, it's hard work putting on this conference. You guys know about it, so the hats off to the organizers, but that's what you've got to do. You know, all those phone calls and all those emails and all that, you know, how do we get there and all that. Getting on with it is part of the name of the game when you're talking about that kind of development. So, if you stand back a little bit, in my optimistic moments, and as you can see, I'm not a pessimist, what I think the options are is that people who care about all this and your friends out there around the country, and you're at the beginning, not the end, and their friends and other friends around the world, not just here, are beginning to generate the ideas, the experience, the projects, the institutions, the knowledge, the relationships, the context, which is the preliminary precondition of building a powerful movement, maybe, that can change the system. You up for that? You up for that? You guys up for that? Do you hear what I'm telling you? Now, in doing that, I like to think about an old Chinese expression. You, you know, anybody, anytime you want to kind of offer people advice, you say, I know an old Chinese expression. <laughs> so here's one. Here's a good one. I like it. it it's, uh, the Chinese have an expression that you have to walk on two legs. And what do they mean by that? It means you have to both do what you can do the old ways as best you can, elect some good guy and maybe he'll help out, you know, organize the normal way, and simultaneously begin this hard institutional development work and see if we can put those pieces together over time. This is not an either or game. It's how do we do the best we can in the traditional ways and simultaneously, walking on two legs, begin to lay the groundwork for something beyond. So I think that is what the spirit of the new economy movement is and the information that is developing that begins to suggest that possibility. Now a couple other things to mention. You want to play the game? The chips are decades of your life. That's what you got to throw on the table. Now you don't have to throw them on right away. You might want to get your feet wet and see find out what's happening. You might want to begin to struggle a little bit with this. But ultimately, if you're talking about a new economy and a new economy movement and transformative change, you're talking about big things. And it involves that kind of creative 
effort as well. There are lots of other pieces of this puzzle that we could get into, but I want to say just two or, two or three things more and then come back to Dr. King. It really all does begin locally. That is to say, if you can't do it in one community and one community and one community and one community and one community, you can't do it. Why? Because that's where people live and die and grow up. So the issue of beginning right here with various experiments, co-ops, resiliency efforts, environmental strategies of different kinds, land trusts, it's another piece of the puzzle, land trusts are another part of this. All of that is laying groundwork, but it has to be beginning in the community and in the state. And I think that's another feature of the new economy movement that you're beginning to see. So I'm stretching your way out to change the system. That's the name of the game. But it comes down to here and now and us. Who else? Nobody else here but us, right? So it is very local in its in, in impact. And local for another sense. Local communities, think about it this way. If you don't build democracy in local communities where people actually live and change the environment of local communities where they actually live and change the economics of local communities where they actually live, you're not changing anything. So a system is all these communities. And then it needs higher, larger structures to help balance out things and economic banks and so forth. But in the name of creating not only communities, but community. How do we, in this process, create a sense of community that we're all in it together? That's also the name of the game. Now, I should back off a little bit because I'm giving you all this idealistic stuff and it's not all this theoretical stuff and pointing you towards model. Uh, the truth is, I've come out of very hard-nosed politics. Uh, I ran House in the U.S. Con Congress. I ran House and Senate staffs, and then I did U.N. planning in the State Department. And I've involved in hard-nosed political campaigns. I've been there, done that. So I know how hard it is really to do this kind of stuff. I am not naive. And yet I'm suggesting to you, as a historian and a political economist, that we happen maybe to live in an era in which fundamental transformative change may be possible if we lay the groundwork. And secondly, all the work is useful and good to do anyway. But that the possibility of raising your sights to that level is really extraordinary and it's worthy of people who really care about their democratic future and their environment and the, and the globe and climate. So one last thing, if I can find my glasses, I'm going to read you one of King's statements or several of them. Because we've been researching this for, some of this is in the book, but we, we ran into things here he says, the good and just society is neither the thesis of capitalism nor the antithesis of communism, but a socially conscious democracy which reconciles the truths of, individual, the truths of individualism and collectivism. It's now another one. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces the beggars needs restructuring. The challenge, he said, we are dealing with issues that cannot be resolved without the nation, this is Dr. Martin Luther King, without the nation undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. And then he even said occasionally, not very often, I can't say this publicly, this is one of the staff members talking about what happened in, in one of the staff meetings, but I had to tape, he said, he said Dr. King asked us to, I'm quoting, Dr. King asked us to turn off the tape recorder. He talked about what he called democratic socialism. And he said, I can't say this publicly. And you say it, and I said it. I, you say I said it, and I'm not going to admit it. And he talked about the fact, and this was the main point, that he didn't believe that capitalism, as it was constructed, could meet the needs of poor people, and that we needed something that looked some kind of socialism, but some kind of democratic form he didn't know of socialism. I don't know about that word, socialism. Uh, but by the way, the latest polls, three of them have come out, where people in the age group that reaches up to 30, a majority find the word socialism more positive than the word capitalism. I didn't know that. Three major national polls, that word doesn't mean much anymore. Barack Obama's a socialist. What he's talking about, whatever the rhetoric is, 
But people under 30 like you guys are the ones that are going to create the next system. And you don't care about that word, apparently. Whatever the next system is, and I think it's mainly viewed, I view it as a community sustaining system that democratizes ownership. Whatever it is, that's what Dr. King was talking about. You couldn't get there from here unless ultimately what your goal was, was building a transformative new economy. So I'm glad to be with folks who want to do that, and I appreciate you coming out on a rainy, rainy day. Thank you very much.